playing not to lose in the world of finance looks like scarcity. It looks like fear, doubt, and worry. It looks like budgeting and constraint and reduction and elimination, and no one shrinks their way to wealth. Yeah, I wrote this book called Killing Sacred Cows. Anyone heard of it? Uh, yeah, and one time someone introduced me and said that I wrote the book Killing Scared Crows, which just sounds like the meanest thing to do. Like, was it a scarecrow or scared crows? I wasn't sure, but um, yeah. That book was really about the nine main financial myths that hold people back. And even though we're gonna be talking about money and finance and cash flow, here's the good news. This isn't gonna be at all about scrimping, saving, or budgeting. It's not a message about sacrifice. See, in a religious context, sacrifice means to make sacred. That's a great thing. But almost any other area of life, when we hear the term sacrifice, it means giving something up. And a lot of times, great things that we give up, including quality of life in the name of a better life one day, someday. The problem is, when does one day, someday actually get here? See, in 2006, I remember we were, it was January and we're sitting there accounting for everything that was going on in our life. And I had started in the financial business in 1998 and we're just like counting our blessings, feeling so good about everything. All the hard work was starting to pay off. And then everything changed June 9th. June 9th, I got a phone call on my home line. I don't even know my home line. My wife still says we have to have a home line because maybe every other cell phone melts down and our kids are gonna need us at that one specific moment, right? I don't even know if they know how to use that home phone, you know, or know what the number would be, but at the same time, I'm getting these calls in the morning and I'm just not, li I'm like not answering because I'm just confused as to what the noise even is. <laughs> like, what is that? So I finally pick it up and it's one of my business partners, his name's Mike, and he says, hey, the company plane left St. George, Utah last night with our other partners, Ray and Les, on it, and no one's heard from them. Now, I'm an optimist, so I was thinking, well, maybe they just went to Vegas. That's not far from, from St. George. Maybe they just took a detour. But once I turned on the news, I had been confirmed that the plane had crashed into Utah Lake. And see, these guys were 35 years old at the time, right? So for the next four months, all I did was work and I worked as hard as I possibly could. And I just, I came from a coal mining family, so I knew how to work hard, but at the same time, a lot of my life was starting to slip away. I gained 22 pounds during that time. I didn't even see, I had a one-year-old son that was born in 2005. I rarely saw him because he was usually asleep by the time I left, and by the time I got back, he was already back to sleep. And I remember being so exhausted trying to like keep everything together and make it happen and do whatever it took to honor their legacy at the sacrifice of my own. See, one of my partners, Les, a month before he died, he pulled me aside after this retreat and he said, you know what, I can't imagine life being any better. I love my life. I love my life. And so at this point, I wasn't really loving my life anymore. I'm just exhausted, and then we're going for Thanksgiving to this little town of Price, Utah, which is a two-hour southeast drive from Salt Lake City where I live, and we're gonna go visit my family, and it's like the first break I've had. And on that drive, we're going through the canyon, which my wife and I have our best conversations in the beautiful mountains, you know, driving in the car, and it starts out pretty awesome. She's telling me I was an extraordinary businessman. I liked hearing it, not gonna lie, you know? She told me I was an extraordinary radio show host, and she used the word extraordinary several times until she looked back at my son in the back seat of our Bentley, which shows and demonstrates all the wealth, but not really how we were really feeling at the time, and looks back at me and says, but you're just an ordinary husband and father. And I, actually, I got pretty emotional instead of getting defensive because she was right. See, and that kind of thought of sacrifice is what is ingrained in a lot of us when we are taught that hard work will get us there. The problem is with hard work and a bad philosophy, it still equals bankruptcy, frustration, starting over. It means a lot of times in the entrepreneurial world, getting on a treadmill and just running faster but not getting further ahead. So instead of talking about sacrifice and scrimping and budgeting, we're gonna look at a different way to do this of injecting cash into your life right now. Does that sound all right? 
things that you could put on the ground in the next, let's say, 48 hours, because you probably have to get home, that will actually boost your bottom line without having to give anything up. As a matter of fact, why don't we make a deal? Part of what we bring to you and give you this insight, you take some of it and you actually put it into your life to improve it because you're your greatest asset. Not a stock, not a bond, not a piece of real estate, but you. So as we get this money, let's have you invest it back into yourself, not just into your business, although you can take and put a lot of it back into your business, but into experiences and memories because I remember when I first started in business, I was with my dad and we're driving, he had one of those 1984 Chrysler New Yorkers. Anyone remember that car? Anyone even, you know, for those that were born back in those days, it was one that was so technologically advanced that when you open the door, it would tell you the door is ajar. Now, I was a kid, I didn't know what the hell that meant. I'm like, no, it's a door, not a jar, but <laughs> whatever. It's super cool that there's a robot voice coming from the car. You know, and we're driving down Main Street and, he, and I'm telling him at the time, because I'm just starting, I'm like, I'm gonna work harder than anyone else is willing to work so I could live a life in the future that no one else can live. And I thought that sounded so amazing and impressive. My dad said to me, he says, guess what? You can never get back the memories that you never have. It's like, okay. So yeah, we're gonna be talking about money and finance here, but I wanna set up the stage that there's really three mindsets around this. The first mindset is playing not to lose. And I, I got really good at playing not to lose growing up in a small coal mining town because I was on the basketball team where we were ahead at halftime 18 times that year, yet at the end of the season, we won three games. That's a professional level of playing not to lose, right? And playing not to lose in the world of finance looks like scarcity, it looks like fear, doubt, and worry, it looks like budgeting and constraint and reduction and elimination, and no one shrinks their way to wealth. I'm, I, I don't know why I'm yelling, I didn't mean to yell. I'm just really excited right now. So no one's done anything wrong that I know of. I'm just passionate, right? So playing not to lose also looks like a term you've probably heard over and over in the financial world, diversification. Diversification for most businesses is diversification. It's actually premature diversification. If you take good money out of your business and put it into plans that are locked away, that you don't know, that you don't understand, that you don't have an exit strategy for, you don't know why it would go up or down, you're just told, invest early, often, and always. This is born of a playing not to lose mindset because you're no longer investing in yourself and fitting that we're here in Orlando because one of the best statements I ever heard on this was written by Roy Disney, Walt's brother. He actually wrote a letter to his parents where he said, you know what? I think a lot of people are gonna learn some hard lessons in the stock market, and this was just before the Great Depression. He said, what we're gonna do is just invest in what we know and put it in this little TV studio that we're launching, or this little studio that we're launching, and look what happened. That's more investing in yourself rather than investing in a bunch of companies that you don't know much about, that you haven't even heard of, you've never been to their boardroom, being in the name of diversification, and waiting for 30 years, by the way. 30 years, who's excited to finally live and enjoy life 30 years from now, right? Can we just question the whole notion of retirement for just a minute and maybe just retire the concept of retirement and enjoy life along the way, not waiting for one day someday, then, oh, well, I'm finally gonna travel when I have to go get a new hip, you know? Not as cool, not as fun. Or if the whole way there, you're in the playing not to lose, scarcity and scrimping mentality, do you finally get there one day and you flip the switch and go, I'm no longer a miserable miser, I'm now an abundant spender, <laughs> you know? Like, that doesn't happen. So it becomes an epidemic, a disease of the mind where people adopt the consumer condition. The consumer condition is a place where people take more value from the world than they give to it. And it is, it is a disease of the mind that destroys wealth. Nothing will destroy wealth more than scarcity. Scarcity, I don't care how much luck, saving, discipline, rate of return, business scale ideas, or anything, if you're in scarcity, you will find a way to make a good thing bad.